announcements before Harry comes to teach tonight. <clears throat> as far as Jerry Seymour is concerned, we are plan they're planning to have a memorial service here October the 1st. That's a Saturday, October the 1st. 10 o'clock will be the visitation, 11 o'clock will be the service. So uh, that's the information that I have right now. Patty Underdahl, of course, you know, I think Miss Janice sent something out for, with Patty Underdahl. I had uh, discussed with Ron, and everything seems to be doing fine right now. They're keeping her overnight, so she'll be there. And just for since Rick is our uh, emphasis, mission emphasis for, for this month of September, uh, he has two schools already scheduled in October, so he is soliciting our prayers. One is in Alabama, close around the home. The other is somewhere in Mississippi. So let's be in prayer for, for Rick and uh, these two adventures that he's going to go on. And please remember to pray for Gary Watson as well. <laughs> okay. All right. I think that'll do it. Mary? I am now. All right. So that was Joyce, if you'll remember her in prayer. All right, let's prepare ourselves for the study of God's Word tonight. And I know you know where we're studying. We're in 1 Peter, the fifth chapter. And we're going to try and get into verse 9 tonight as we wrap up verse 8. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you, Father, for the eternal position that we have in Christ. All compliments of your grace, the work of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, who bore our sin debt in total, so that by simple faith we can have eternal life. We thank you, Father, for the grace gift of restoration as we sin in our daily lives as, as believers in Christ. That places us out of fellowship. Therefore, we're out of the mentorship, ministry, and guidance and direction of God the Holy Spirit, unable to apply truth that we may have learned. But we thank you that you've provided a way also, in grace, by faith, accepting the fact that if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we thank you for that. So now we can ask that God the Holy Spirit would reveal our thinking into our thinking, that which you have for us tonight, that we might understand that this portion of Scripture that you have given to us. We thank you again for the answers to prayer, for these who have had successful surgery, for the comfort that you give to the Seymour family, and for others who are sick, including we remember in Joyce and there are others, that you would remember that we would uh, ask you to minister into their lives in accordance to your will. For we ask these things in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. You, recall, you will recall that we are in the second paragraph of the fifth chapter in which the command has been given for us to humble ourselves. And that is demonstrated as we cast our cares upon him. So let's read the text. Verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time, at the time that he chooses, casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Now, we need to be aware that we're to take our spiritual life seriously. So he says, be of sober spirit. Be on the alert, be cautious, be diligent. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Sounds pretty bad. But, but, I always look for those words, but, 
Resist him, firm in the faith, or in your faith, actually the faith, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished or endured or experienced by your brethren who are in the world. Now, you recall that last time, and I'm just going to quickly review some of this, we looked at the doctrine or the concept of the roar of the lion. And it's always designed for one thing, and that is to distract, to startle you, to insert fear, maybe, to get your attention. That's not what the lion normally does. He doesn't go around roaring all the time when he's not after something. But when he's after something in the chase, in order to get it, because he isn't as fast, perhaps, as the deer, he has to get that deer to stop in its tracks. And that gives him just enough time to get there. Now, we know that uh, if the animal hesitates, it will get caught. Now, some animals, we know, have God has given them natural defenses. Otherwise, they wouldn't be around. Odor, speed, flight, so forth, hearing, real keen hearing. Oh, the, the old armadillo is just about as blind as he can be. A boy can hear. <laughs> he can hear. Now, how are we going to get away from him? Well, for the unbeliever... God has set into place the laws of divine establishment by which he can observe the tenets, the thing, the principles that God has established for a nation, for its well-being. And then, of course, ultimately, faith in Christ as Savior. That's the key one. But he can live within the confines of the laws of divine establishment and not have a spiritual life, no, but have a natural, moral life. Of course, the end result of that is not good, so we w he would want to go to faith in Christ. How about for the believer? Well, we have the filling of the Spirit. We have the Word of God to teach us. We can learn and we can apply the Word of God as God the Holy Spirit reveals into our thinking truth. So we can escape the roar of the lion by walking by means of the Spirit. Now, the thing, and I've, it was very interesting as I read various commentaries on this, so many of them went to that the lion just wants to eat you up and you disappear. No, don't think so. Maybe that's the way it is in the natural world. To kill and eat, and it's gone. But that's not, that's not what Peter's trying to do here. You have to be careful when you take a, a figure like this and you stretch it. Sometimes you can stretch it out of place. And the roar of the lion is not to devour you in the sense of killing you and eliminate you from this life, but Satan doesn't have that power to take your life. But he has a power to render you useless if you respond to his roar. And that's what he wants. Because you see, he wants your thoughts to become aligned with his thoughts. He wants your thinking to be his thinking. And that renders you useless for Christ, but here, <laughs> still living on earth, but now, you're an enemy of the cross of Christ. And you're doing his bidding. And he has you right where he wants you. And he promotes you in his ways because you're effective now for him. So he doesn't want to eliminate us off the scene. He just wants to keep us here serving him. Not interested in taking your life away from you as a believer. But he wants to make sure that you serve him rather than the Lord. Now, if you're walking by means of the Spirit, if you're walking in the Word, if you're in fellowship, the roar of the lion 
is ineffective toward, uh, against you. It's ineffective. It has no power over you. Remember that you have, by the way, an advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, who's also called a lion, the lion of Judah. You have a greater lion than Satan. And that's First John 4.4. 4. Then we looked briefly, we started looking at the strategies, the strategies of the devil. Now, he has a strategy toward believers. He loves to accuse us for our faults and our sins, our failures. And he does it sometimes in the convocation of angels in heaven. For instance, we saw that in Job. Remember the Lord asked him in, in Job, the first chapter, what have you, where have you been, Satan? Now remember, the scene is in heaven. A lot of folks don't understand that. They think that Satan has no access. He has access to heaven today. And he goes and says, well, where have you been? He says, well, going to and fro. Roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. And then the Lord said, well, have you thought about Job? Have you, did, you, did you notice Job? Yes, he had. He noticed that Job was righteous, upright, walking with the Lord. Job is a potential target. And, the Lord, and Satan throws up the accusation, well, does Job... Is he being righteous for, no, for nothing? I mean, after all, you've, you've put a hedge around him. Praise the Lord <laughs> that we have a hedge. You, you're protecting him. You've encompassed him on every side. Remember, don't be anxious for anything. When everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes human comprehension, will... Encompass. Build a garrison around you. He said, but now you let me take that away and he'll curse you. And of course, that's you have to read the whole book of Job to see how that plays out. But what about a high priest? I mean, does he go after preachers? People who are Way, very well known in the ministry. Maybe not well known in the ministry. Zechariah, the third chapter. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. That's the pre-incarnate Christ. And Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Right there. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not the brand? Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Have you ever wondered why he likes to accuse you and I when we find ourselves out in the Thule's for especially for a while? I see the, the key is you commit a sin, confess it right then and there. You spare yourself a lot of misery and you don't give Satan an opportunity to join the convocation in heaven and bring your name up <laughs> because it's already taken care of. You've already admitted it. You ever wondered though why he likes to bring up our name before the Lord? I think he, for one thing he wants to say, aha, you, you, you judged me. For my rebellion, well, look at your own child, one who claims to be your child. That's unjust. You need to reprieve my sentence. I think he does it in order seeking for a reprieve. Why? Because he knows his doom. Matthew tells us, Matthew 25, 41, his doom is where? The lake of fire. He and his angels. So I think he's seeking a reprieve of his sentence. Hasn't been carried out yet, but it will be. But we can bypass all those problems of extended periods of time being out of fellowship 
The moment we sin, God the Holy Spirit is faithful, isn't he? To reveal it to us. Sometimes he reveals it to us in the temptation stage. Or when that little thought came into our mind to do something that's wrong. And God the Holy Spirit says, wait a minute. I call it that little red flag that comes up. That's for me. Or maybe my ears burned. I don't know about you. Have you Do your ears ever burn? Mine do sometimes. And that lets me know, oh, there's, some, there's a problem there. Admit it to the Lord. Now, you see, a lot of people believe in confession of sin, but they confess to the wrong person. Flip my collar upside down and, you know, and now tell me your sins. Please don't do that. I have enough problems of my own. Why would we confess our sins claiming forgiveness to another person? They're a sinner like we are. You confess to the Father who can do something about it. Who are, let me change that verb. Who has already done something about it because it was paid for on the cross. It was judged on the cross. You're just claiming the forgiveness of what's already taken place on the cross. And by the way, just like salvation never changes. It's always the same. Faith alone in Christ alone. Faith alone in the Christ who would come. Faith alone in the Christ who came. It's always the same throughout all of human history. So is the confession of sin, the restoration to fellowship. David said in Psalm 32, 5, against thee, I acknowledge my sin to thee. In the New Testament, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. Why can he do that? In the Old Testament, because Christ was going to take care of that sin on the cross. How, why does he do it in the New Testament time, church age? Because Christ did pay for our sins on the cross. So John says in 1 John 1, 2, verse 1, My little children, I am writing these things that you may not sin. John says, look, be nice if you didn't sin. I've written you these things to keep you from sinning. But... If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Well, I've always wondered. Some, do you ever just wonder about some things in Scripture that aren't mentioned and that you're going to ask the Lord when you get to heaven about it? Do you ever do that? Well, here's one for you. Did God give the fallen angels an opportunity to change their thinking In, after they, they rebelled against God. Did he offer them some kind of salvation, shall we say? Well, your guess is as good as mine, <laughs> okay? So there's no point in, in spending the next 40 minutes in conjecturing. However, let's bring it where it is relevant it is relevant that he did extend mercy and grace to the human race in their rebellion against God. And it's just very possible that he did that in some way or form to the fallen angels and even to Lucifer. We don't know. But that's on my list to ask. And I'm sure you probably have a little list too. We ought to maybe compile them sometime and see things we want to ask if, if there's a question and answering period in Bible class 101. <laughs> okay. Now, we do know, though, some things about that rebellion, and we do know that the angels do not have an opportunity to change their thinking. It's locked in negative because if nothing else, by the demonstration of their actions throughout human history. They haven't changed. They don't intend to change their thinking. They're opposed to God. Satan is opposed to God. And he doesn't intend to change it. And he still thinks he's going to win. It's like that. I heard Jimmy Connors one time talking about tennis. He said, 
in tennis. He said, you know, sometimes I'd, I would be playing and I miss a shot. And he said, I just ought to let that shot go and not worry about it. And he said, but another one, and I'll try the very same shot again and I'll miss it. He said, I've missed sometimes the same shot ten times trying to get it right. No, <laughs> just, just let it go. Let it go. The b- rebellion has continued and it's going to end up in the lake of fire. Well, Satan also likes to hinder you and I from learning God's word, doesn't he? Yeah. He doesn't want us to grow spiritually. He wants us to keep us in diapers, babies. Nothing worse than being a pastor of a congregation where you have a bunch of babies that are, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. But they're spiritual babies. And you have to just, you know, it's almost like tiptoeing, tiptoeing, tiptoeing. Not to offend. That's how Satan wants us to be. He doesn't want us to learn the word. He would just soon we ignore the word. But if we are not going to ignore the word, at least come and have something else on your mind while you're doing it, while you're hearing the teaching of the word, so that God the Holy Spirit isn't able to reveal to you the truth that you had. Now, does that work? Well, sure it works. It worked in the garden. You see, Satan doesn't try anything that he hasn't already tested. His book, his script, is basically the same throughout all of human history. Chapter and verse is basically the same. In the garden, what did he do? But I'm afraid, lest as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, Paul says, your minds should be led astray from the simplicity and the purity of devotion to Christ. What does Satan do? deceives you by his craftiness. He's been doing it since Adam and Eve in the garden. He's still doing it today. In fact, 1 Timothy, Paul tells to Timothy 4, 1 through 3, the Spirit says that in the latter times, explicitly, some shall fall away from the truth, from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of hypocrisy of liars seared in their own consciousness with a branding iron. So here comes somebody and says, I have a new word from God. Ever heard of people say that? I have. I have a word from God. I have a new word from God. Really? Well, you know what? I'm afraid 1 Timothy chapter 4 fits you very well. You've been paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. And those people who told you that are hypocrites, liars. How do I know that there's no other word from God? Well, read the end of the book of the Revelation. It says, don't add a thing. Don't take anything away. It's finished. It's closed. It's a closed revelation of God to mankind, and it is not to be tampered with. We're not to add on, we're not to take away. So if someone comes in and tries to tantalize you with, I heard a new word from God, say, if you don't mind, <laughs> I remember someone coming to me, I really, I used to do things when I first got on doctrine, I used to, and I don't advise this, it's not very gracious, but I used to try to, Sock, you know, whack people with startling things. And this man came up to me and said, well, Do you have the second blessing? I said, I don't want it. Man, he about had a heart attack. What do you mean you don't want the second blessing? No, I don't. You know why? Because I have all spiritual blessings. Why do I want number two? when I've got gazillions already. But that's how, that's how Satan does. He, he comes and lets you think that, well, have you heard? Did your pastor tell you? Oh, he didn't. Oh, my. Why is he not telling, teaching you that? 
Third strategy. He wants to frustrate the will of God in your life. Three things about the will of God. What does God want me to do in any given situation? James says, submit your ther- therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands. Make sure you're in fellowship, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. What does God want me to do in any given situation? That's his operational will for you. But God also has another will for you. He has a geographical will for you. And this one's a little tougher. Where does God want me to be? Where does God want me to be tonight? Where does God want me to be tomorrow? Where does God want me to live? His geographical will. I think I mentioned to you one of the difficult things is that sometimes we contemplate a move and it's not even entered our mind, well, where will I worship and be taught the Word of God? Why is that the last thing rather than the first thing? Do you move in order to get the teaching of the Word of God? That's a great move. That's a great move. Now, that doesn't mean that there's only one place to get the Word of God. (laughs) Okay? It isn't just here. There are other places that are teaching the Word of God, too. Maybe not the same format or whatever, but the Word of God is being taught. So we're not criticizing that. But the priority should be, where am I going to be spiritually fed? Because God has a geographical will for my life. There's a place that he wants me to be. I've heard missionaries say, you know, I told the Lord I was I committed to go to, to South America. And it was just a colossal bomb when he got there. And tried to stay, and it just... This is a disaster. Was God wrong? No. He, he was wrong. <laughs> he was wrong. He had made that con- commitment and come to those conclusions for the wrong reasons. Maybe in ignorance. Or maybe not with enough prayer behind it. But it's important to know that you're in the geographical will of God. And then thirdly, what does God want you to think? You know, what goes on between your two ears? What does God want me to think? Because, you see, what I think is what I am. Paul says to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 14, you're not little children anymore, tossed here and there by waves, that we can expect that. We can expect believers who are not grounded in the word of God to be tossed to and fro. But don't stay in that position, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by the craftiness of deceitful scheming. You don't want to be in that position. I don't want to be in that position. In fact, we're going to see tonight that we're to be quite the opposite. We're to stand firm. We're to resist. But you know, Satan just comes along and he says, not only to us individually, but also as groups and even as a nation, look, we have a lot of problems. We do, personally, collectively, nationally. And he says, I've got an answer for them. I can solve your problems. Think this way. Do this. Do that. And it's always, if you'll notice, his, his plan, his program, his solutions are always devoid of one factor. God. God is never in them. Evil cancels out God as a factor. He wants you to solve your own problems with human effort apart from God. You've lived long enough to remember government programs, haven't you? 
They, they just resurrect them, you know, with a different title. But I remember we were going to train everybody, the job training program. And uh, I was in the 70s. I remember that. And it was the hottest thing there on the market. We were going to retrain everybody and give them jobs and every. You know what that did? It padded the pockets of the administrator of the job program. I saw it with my own eyes. I happened to be in, in, uh, in the printing business at the time with, with uh, two other men. Uh, we had the first Xerox machine in Tallahassee for copying services. And then we t went into printing. And I was printing these financial sheets. And let me tell you, these guys up to the top were raking it in. But were they training the people that needed jobs? Very little. You see, Satan always has this program. Let's end poverty. So how many different programs do you know? Remember, chicken in every pot? That was one of them. One of the presidents had that. And then we're going to end poverty. And, you know, Appalachian, Appalachian, they went to West Virginia. Oh, man, what a horrible thing. They were just going to remove all the property out of West Virginia, uh, the poverty out of those places. What did Jesus say about that? The poor you will have with you always. There's nothing wrong with being poor. It's not a sin to be poor. Most of us grew up rather poor, but we didn't know it. Because mom and dad saw to it that we had food on the table and clean clothes to wear. And we didn't know you were supposed to own two automobiles. We had two feet. And a bus. We're going to eradicate crime. Now the latest one is defund. See, that's the latest program. Defund the police. And remove the prisons. And all the... Some idiot yesterday said, let's, let's get rid of... Uh, uh, let's absolve all second-degree murder charges, uh, sentences. How would you like to have a second-degree murderer sitting by you? <laughs> or are we going to redistribute the wealth? Now, that one's been around a while. That's communism. Redistrib but you see, in this country, we call it different things. We don't say it's communist. We just call it, we're going to equality. Sounds good, doesn't it? You hear it on the news. It sounds good to people who are, non, who are not conscious of the word of God. High-sounding words. High-sounding words. But they're disastrous. Human fix-it programs never, ever solve man's problems. You cannot solve your problems apart from God, from the Word of God, from the Lord Jesus Christ. So, what does he seek to do? He wants to destroy your focus. He wants to intercept you doing what you're doing if you're a believer and you're pursuing God's plan for your life and you're, you're growing spiritually. What does Satan want to do? He wants to do an end run on you and intercept you. He roars. And you... I think I mentioned it did I not before, last, a couple weeks ago? Uh, it's a great technique to get a deer to stop running. If he jumps and goes off on a run on you, and you didn't get the shot, you holler at him, and he'll stop. Just long enough for you to pull the trigger. Now, what do people look like? that have succumbed to the roar of the lion. Well, I think there's several things that we can see. They're discontent. They're discontent in their spiritual life. Can't satisfy them with anything. It's all about me. That's a key one. It's all about me. 
They have their eyes on the problem. Oh, gosh. It's just horrible. Without having a balance there, you recognize the problem, then they recognize what? There is someone who can solve that problem. Spiritually. There's someone who in eternity past already knew everything that would happen in your life and my life and made provision for it. <laughs> but it's so hard sometimes to tap into that truth and see him work and allow him to work and pull that provision out and let it work in our lives. Look at 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, verse 10. We've got a fellow there that's had his eyes all on himself. He was a great man of God. Great man of God. Then he came to a cave. He's talking about Elijah. And he lodged there. And behold, remember, it was the fear of the, the roar of the woman got him. Oh, Jezebel says, I'm going to get you. By tomorrow at sundown, you'll be a dead man. Man, he took off running. Then he came to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him. <laughs> I love the Lord's humor. And he said, the Lord said to him, what are you doing here? <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> and he said, well, I've been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts of the armies. Oh, God of the armies? And you're afraid? For the sons of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, torn down thine altars, and killed thy prophets with the sword. And I alone am left. It's just me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Well, that's a good song. But you can see how he's being self-pity, eyes on self. He's, he's bemoaning him, his condition. I am left alone, and they seek my life to take it away. Pity for me. Well, you know the rest of the story. I hope you remember. <laughs> the Lord said, look, he ain't the only one alone. But even if you were, I'm with you. <laughs> and that'd be enough. But he said, there's 7,000 other people there that have never bowed the knee to Baal. And what about, does Satan want to get us our eyes on people? Oh, look who's here tonight. Well, I'm sure it's surprised. About time they show up. You know, they've been this and that and the other. Or, do you know what that person said to me? Eyes on people. The roar of eyes on people. See, we cannot afford to let people distract us from our pursuit of God's word. Our spiritual walk. Look, we all have faults. What right do I have to pick out your fault and let it become a distraction to me when I have a ton of my own that are probably potential distractions for you? That's why the Lord says in Jeremiah 17.5, He warns us. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength and whose heart turns away from the Lord. Not happiness to the man, but cursed is the man who places his trust in the Lord. I had a fellow tell me this week, he said, man, I just can't wait till the November election so that everything can get turned around and you know what I thought of right then? That verse in the Bible. And I didn't look it up, so I can't give you the documentation, but there's a verse in there that says, about, don't put your trust in princes, in those who rule. Eyes on things. That's a roar. Get your eyes on things. The love of money. Not money, but the love of it. I'm going to do whatever I have to do because I want more. And you never get enough. The writer says to the Hebrews, why don't you be content with what you have? 
Be content with what you have, Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. For the Lord said, look, I'm never going to leave you, desert you, nor will I forsake you. So you can confidently say the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. And then you can come to this conclusion. What shall man do to me? Man is unable to do anything to you that the Lord does not permit. Well, unfortunately, because we fail, go back up to like verse earlier in the verses, before humbling yourself, casting your burdens upon the Lord, we fail in our spiritual lives because we don't appropriate God's grace blessings. Remember I told you that we have all spiritual blessings? We don't need number two, number three, number 10, number 19. We have all spiritual blessings. They're there in the bank of heaven. They're in escrow for you and I. And God says, I want you to come tap in, write a withdrawal slip. And get what I have for you. You'll enjoy it. Because it's designed exactly for you. Well, he likes to instill the fear of death on us. But here's what the scripture says in Hebrews 2, 5, 14. Since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partake of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might deliver those who through fear of death, fear of death, were subject to slavery all their lives. There's some people who can't do a thing because they're so scared to do it. I've seen that happen. You have too. They're just so fearful that they won't try to do something because they might not get it. They may not make it right. They're so, I tell my singers, I tell my ladies ensemble, make, when you make a mistake, please make it loud enough that I can hear it. Then I can fix it. School teachers say this. What's at the top end of your pencil? An eraser. What's it there for? To fix what you miss. And that's the way it needs to be in our spiritual lives. Look, we're going to mess up. But we have a means of correcting it. We don't have to be subject to fear of death. Why? Why? Psalm 23, 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Well, those are strategies that Satan has toward believers, but he also has tactics, strategies for the unbeliever. He seeks so much to keep us from hearing the gospel. He wants to control us through his, the sin nature. He seeks to impede us Hearing the gospel, or if we hear the gospel, he tries to interfere with the work of the Holy Spirit in, con in convicting us of our need of the Savior. And the Lord gave that parable in Luke 8 about the sowing the seed. And some fell on the road, some trampled, some the birds ate up. The devil comes and takes away the word of the, uh, from their heart so that they may not believe and be saved. Well, Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians the gospel being veiled to those who are perishing. How do you get around that being veiled? Satan wants to place the veil of ignorance and, 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 and doubt and fear in your mind. But you have volition. You have choice. You can choose to hear the presentation of the gospel. And then it becomes the power of God and the salvation in your life. Well, Satan also wants to substitute his thoughts for your thoughts. We call it human viewpoint. Evil, human good for divine viewpoint. And he's, he, he loves this. Colossians 2.8 See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception. According to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. 
I remember sitting in front row, 8 o'clock in the morning. I had to sit in the front row, otherwise I'd fall out of this. I, I couldn't stay awake. In a philosophy class in college. And let me tell you, it was deep. It was deep. And I, you know, I, I studied and I regurgitated on the test of what I was taught. So I pulled the A, but I never understood a thing of what the man standing as closer to me than you and I are was teaching about how to find God. How to find God. And it wasn't until, you know, reflection a few years later, and thinking about this verse here. You can't find God through human thinking. You can't find God through philosophy. Impossible. You can only know God through one person. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. And God the Holy Spirit revealing the person of Christ through the teaching of the word of God. You see, all that philosophy and everything, Descartes and all these other guys, Kant and, you know, that I just remember a few names. I can't tell you much about them, but, but they were trying to figure out God and know God by making themselves something. I'm going to try to know God. I am. No, it doesn't work that way. That's the, same, that's the attitude of Satan, wasn't it? I will ascend, remember Isaiah the 14th chapter? I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit on the mount of the assembly of the resources of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high God. You see, Satan always wants this thing. He wants you and I to think that if we could just open our eyes to his way of thinking, we would be gods ourselves. For God knows, this is what he told Adam and Eve, for God knows that in the day you eat from, from, the, from the tree that you're not supposed to eat from, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. No, that was rather enticing to her. And finally, all. Well, Satan has a strategy toward nations. And boy, is he active today. Though I have to say, and I'm, I'm, I hope you caught, caught the little clip on the news, McElhaney, she gave a wonderful testimony this week for Christ as she was talking about the service for Queen Elizabeth II. She gave the gospel. But one another thing that caught my mind was the queen had a hymn written for the occasion. She commissioned a Scottish composer to write a hymn on the text, Who Can Separate Us from the Love of Christ? That whole verse. It's beautiful. What a testimony. Don't know her spiritual life, the depths of it or whatever. But she knew that verse. <laughs> For you see, if you're in Christ, nothing can separate you from the love of Christ that is found in Christ Jesus. Well, you know that Satan is going to try and tear down the nations because he is against nations. See, nations are, have a geographical location and a set of values, and a set of rules by which they govern themselves. And he doesn't want that. You see, because he can't handle in his un-omnipotence, <laughs> not omnipotence, no such word. He can't handle all these different elements, entities. He has to have one thing that he can then ascend to and be ruler over all. So when you hear these magnificent terms of globalism, guess who they came from? Right out of Satan's mouth. One world. 
one currency, one language, one economy. Let's all go electric. See, he can handle that. He can handle that. But he can't handle Mexico, United States, Canada, Honduras, South America with its many nations, Europe with its many nations, independent nations. That's a problem. So he's got to bring them all together. And he's so busy doing it. And he's trying, working overtime, trying to do this. And of course, then we know that there's going to be a final war against the Lord after perfect environment. After the millennial reign of Christ, which is going to be a thousand years of perfect environment. The Lord ruling with a rod of iron because he's not going to allow that which is adverse to pop its head up. But Satan's going to marshal together the negative volition that's still in individuals' lives even though they lived in a perfect setting with the Lord Jesus Christ ruling. He's going to marshal them against the Lord. Verse 9, let's get on it. Just have a few minutes. But resist him. Now he's doing all these strategies that he's attacking, but we have an option. We can resist him, but resist him firm in, and it's better translated, the faith. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by the brethren who are in the world. Now, remember, Satan wants to neutralize you and I, and he is able to do that if we remain in carnality, if we stay out of the will of God, if we stay out of fellowship. But if we keep short accounts with God, that won't happen. He's already told us to be of sober spirit, to be diligent, to be cautious. Don't vacillate back and forth. Know what you believe, why you believe it, and stand firm in what you believe. So we are able to resist him firm in the faith. Hopistus. Now the word, uh, let me show you this. And the word uh, anhistomy, uh, or anastami, actually, is an aorist active imperative. We're to do it. We are to stand firm in the faith. And our weapon of choice, what is the most effective weapon that we have? The Word of God. The Word of God. Daily brought into our lives. And then to use it. We have a reservoir of, in, uh, of ammunition that doesn't cease, that doesn't go empty. The promises and principles of the Word of God. Now, it's the faith. Rather, you know, Some translations say your, but I think it's best to translate it ho, the faith. And the reason for that article is this. We're not talking about your personal faith, how much faith you have, but rather the body of knowledge, of doctrine. The truth, the body of truth. We're to stand firm, not in our own, really, frailty, really, right? But rather, we're to stand firm in the truth, the Word of God. Now, there's one catch to that. You got to know it to use it. (laughs) If you don't know it, you can't use it. What are we to learn? Well, there's wonderful things to learn in the Old Testament. And there are to be examples for us into the New Testament. But then there's some truths that we're to learn in the New Testament that weren't found in the Old Testament. We're to look at how is it that God equipped the humanity of Christ so that Christ could fulfill his function when he came. Those very same blessings the very same tools for living the Christ's life in his life are now available to us. But we have to know them. We have to know what did Christ, his past, his present, his future. We have to know where we came from, what we have now in Christ, 
and what we can look forward to in the, in the future. Look, you can't live, I can't live the spiritual life in ignorance of the word of God. Just can't do it. It's impossible. So how are you going to stand faith firm? You have to use the word of God. You're going to be solid in your faith. You're going to know the truths that pertain to the situation that you find yourself in. It isn't God bless all the missionaries all over the world. Be specific. Yes, we do want God to bless all the missionaries who are doing their job. Right. But be specific. I had prayer last night with Patty Underdahl over the phone and I asked the Lord to give them safety to travel and the surgery to be a success and to get them back all the way in the door of their house. Because I've already told you that I made the mistake of one time praying for the Lord to get me to a certain town and my car broke down right at the city limit sign. I learned that lesson in 1970. I didn't pray far enough. I did, literally. It was, we were Hitchcock, Florida, and my, my car did. Church was still an hour, a mile and a half up the road. And of course, you know, it was time for almost for service to start. <laughs> and I was the pianist. No, be specific in your prayer so that you can stand. Take the specific truth that God the Holy Spirit will reveal to you to use and apply it to the situation. And don't ever think that you and I are the only ones in the arena of conflict. For he says what? Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being endured, experienced, accomplished in your brethren who are in the world. And we'll have to pick up at this point next time because we're going to look once again at the suffering that we see believers facing not only here in this country but in other countries. And it's undeserved a lot of times because of one thing, they name the name of Christ. We're still fortunate. We may get personal reproach. We may be, have digs said to us. We may be ridiculed. But at least so far in this country, we're not experiencing our homes burnt, our churches burned down, though there's always smatterings of that, but not as a rule of thumb. But we're not the only ones suffering. We need to remember those brethren who are suffering for the name of Christ. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this time together. May God, the Holy Spirit, make these things very real and conscious of them to us. May we be on the alert. May we be, may we be cautious as believers that when we hear something and God, the Holy Spirit, says, eh, that doesn't quite click right, that we'll have an answer, that we'll know what to do if nothing else, to resist ourselves and say, no, thank you, not for me. Oh, may God the Holy Spirit take these things and make them a source of nourishment to our souls and for spiritual growth to be accelerated. In these days when we see things rapidly coming to what appears to be the blessed hope, our Savior coming to call us home. Well, we ask it in Christ's name.